Afternoon. This is a City Planning Commission special meeting held at New York City City Planning Commission Hearing Room, Lower Concourse, 120 Broadway. Today is Monday, February 25th, 2019, and the time is 1.02 p.m. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago? Here. Vice Chair Knuckles? Here. Here. Commissioner Cirillo? Here. Commissioner De La Uz? Here. Commissioner Dweck? Commissioner Eady? Here. Commissioner Knight? Here. Commissioner Levin? Here. Commissioner Wren? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Commissioner Rampashad? Here. A quorum is present. Uh, let's turn to page one in the calendar. Reports section, Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers one through four, CD2. Calendar number one, C190071, ZMK. Calendar number two, C190072, ZSK. Calendar number three, C190073, ZSK. Calendar number four, N190074, ZRK. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments for the grant of special permits concerning 809 Atlantic Avenue, rezoning for favorable reports on calendar numbers one, two, three, and four. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes, and hoping that the council modified to uh, option, MIH option one, as both the community board and the borough president recommended. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Rampashad? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers one, two, three, and four. I believe that is all the business, so we yes. can close the public hearing. This concludes the public meeting. This con concludes the special meeting of uh, February 25th, 2019. <clears throat> the time is 1.04 p.m. Okay. Good afternoon. This is the review session of the New York City Planning Commission uh, for Monday, February 25th, 2019. And the time is, let's say, 1.05 p.m. Uh, <laughs> just say that. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a certification of an amendment to an urban renewal plan, UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned property in Bronx Community District 1. Our presenter is James Rather. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, the project before you is 784 Cortland Avenue, located in the Melrose neighborhood of Bronx Community District 1 and within the Melrose Commons Urban Renewal Area. Uh, HPD is the applicant and Infinite, Infinite Horizons is the project sponsor. The proposed project would include a seven-story mixed-use building with 20 affordable units and approximately 6,600 square feet of commercial and community facility space on the lower floors. The actions before you would facilitate the project by removing the 45-foot height cap for the site as currently set forth within the Melrose Commons Urban Renewal Plan, allowing the building to be built up to the height permitted by zoning. So here's some of the surrounding context with the view of the Melrose neighborhood here. The project site is highlighted in yellow. As you can see, it's located within the southwest corner of the urban renewal area. Uh, to the north of the site lies the western portion of the Europe renewal area, the URA, uh, largely consisting of multifamily development interspersed with neighborhood retail. East 161st Street, a wide street in the major east-west connector, is located less than a 10-minute walk to the north. Uh, also to the north lies the Harlem line of Metro North Railroad, shown in blue here, in its Melrose station, uh, which is within walking distance of the site. To the west lies the campus of NYCHA's Jackson Houses with the towers of Morrisania Air Rights and Concourse Village uh, located just beyond. 
To the south uh, is PS29, the Melrose School, with uh, more multifamily residential blocks that make up much of Melrose located just beyond. And farther to the south, you have the Hub Commercial District, uh, which uh, provides access to the 2-5 train uh, by the 3rd Avenue East 149th Street stop. And then to the east uh, lie a largely uh, residential collection of blocks uh, within the URA, uh, all the way over to 3rd Avenue and uh, St. Anne's Avenue. So I want to take a moment to walk through some of the history of the URA and highlight some of the key development sites. Uh, so the URA is uh, bounded by East 163rd to the north, 3rd St. Anne's, Anne's and Brook Avenues to the east, East 156th Street to the south, and then Park Avenue to the west. Uh, the Urban Renewal Plan, or URP, was created as a response to the sustained disinvestment experienced by this neighborhood during the 1970s and 1980s, and was undertaken in order to help spur its revitalization. Since its adoption in 1994, the plan has been amended three times. Uh, first, in 2007, to remove uh, height restrictions and increase maximum unit limits on several parcels to facilitate the development of Barucco Village and Cortland Corners, uh, as uh, seen here. Second, in 2011, to modify the URP street wall requirements and height limits to facilitate the development of Cortland Crescent, which is also shown here in orange. Uh, then third, in 2015, to modify the land use requirements of the plan to facilitate the development of Melrose Commons North Sites B and C, which will include several hundred units, as well as the Bronx Music Hall upon completion. All the sites that I've mentioned uh, have either been completed or are close to completion, and this represents one of the most successful development models used in the Bronx. Uh, and, and when finished, there will be nearly 3,600 units uh, once they all come online, uh, all of which will be affordable. So here's some additional surrounding context. Uh, this is an oblique view looking towards the northeast. So you have the project site again in yellow. Uh, you can see the purple boundary of the URA there, so it just lies just, just within the URA. Uh, to the right of that, on, on the right-hand side of the frame, you have uh, PS29. You can see the baseball field that's on the PS29 site. And then on the other side, on the left-hand side, you have NYCHA's Jackson Houses. So the nearest open space to the site uh, is located on the subject block. It is the Cortland Avenue Community Garden. You can see there it's located on East 158th Street. Uh, visible also on the subject block are a group of three-story townhomes and a 12-story mixed-use building located on the corner of East 158th and Melrose Ave. Uh, the Harlem line that I had mentioned is in the upper left-hand side of the frame, as well as East 156th Street there. I'm sorry, 165th Street there. And then visible in the background is much of the URA itself, and you can see the Tower of Brooklyn College there, sort of in the upper uh, center portion of the frame. So here's a view of the site uh, looking again toward the northeast. This is in its current vacant condition. Uh, this vantage point is uh, at the corner of East 157th and Cortland Avenue looking north. Uh, on the right-hand side of the frame are, you can see, part of the three-story townhomes that I had mentioned previously. Uh, and then the laundromat that is one of the nearby neighborhood retail uh, sites uh, is located just, uh, just to the north of the site. So there's a little stretch of retail along Cortland Avenue that you can see some of here. Here are some additional uh, existing conditions photos of the project site. Uh, on the upper right-hand side is a view uh, facing east. Again, you can see the, the three-story townhomes and the laundromat on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, on the lower right-hand side, you have a view looking to the west, so towards uh, Cortland Avenue. So you can see the Jackson Houses and more senior air rights visible just beyond. And then on the lower uh, left-hand side, you have a view looking uh, to the north, so similar to the original photo that I had shown. You can see a little bit more of Cortland Avenue and uh, a little bit more Sandy Air Rights there, too. So here are the area uh, and land use map. Uh, you can see here uh, it's predominantly multifamily multi residential. Uh, open space resources visible here uh, include uh, Melrose Playground, which is to the south on the opposite side of Cortland Avenue. Uh, Flynn Playground is located uh, nearby as well on East 157th and 3rd Avenue. Uh, a few other local parks and gardens, community gardens are visible here. I should note that the gardens are largely coated uh, gray here, is vacant. The project site is located within, within an R72 district that extends to Park Avenue to the west, uh, mid-block between East 160th and 161st to the north, just past Melrose Ave to the east and to East 157th to the south. Uh, 
The R72 allows medium density residential uses up to an FAR of 4.0 on a wide street. Uh, C14 commercial overlays uh, are located on some of the block frontages along Cortland Avenue and Melrose Ave. Uh, the subject block includes a C14 overlay as well. To the west lie R8 and R8A districts uh, with another R8 along 161st, another R72 within the URA to the east, and an R6 to the south. So here are two illustrative renderings of the proposed building. This would be a mixed-use building rising to a height of seven stories and 75 feet. Uh, the building uh, complies with the existing R72 zoning, uh, which allows up to 85 feet in height. There would be a two-story base on East 157th with the primarily residential portion of the building set back from the street on floors uh, three through seven above. The proposed program includes 20 affordable units on floors two through seven with the first floor entry located on Cortland Avenue. The proposed bedroom mix is five one-bedroom units, 10 two-bedroom units, and then five three-bedroom units. Uh, HPD's neighborhood construction program uh, represents a primary uh, portion of the project's financing. Uh, the proposed AMI mix would include units between 30 and 80% of AMI, and the local AMI is $24,467. Uh, the building would include a, a green roof and solar panels, along with 13 bike parking spaces and self-storage units for tenants. Uh, other amenities would include a three-story, I'm sorry, a third floor recreational uh, terrace, a second floor washer and dryer room, and individual unit uh, climate controls. No vehicular parking is proposed and none is required for the site. Uh, community facility uses uh, totaling 4,845 square feet will be located within the cellar, first and second floors. These spaces would have entries on East 157th and Cortland Avenue. And commercial uses totaling 1,800 square feet are proposed for the ground floor. Uh, entry, to, entry to this space would be located on uh, Cortland Avenue. So uh, the proposed urban renewal plan amendment um, would add the project site to a list of uh, other existing sites within the URP that currently, uh, to which the 45 foot high cap does not apply. So there are three uh, other sites and this would be an additional site added to that list. Uh, this would represent the fourth amendment to the uh, URP since its original adoption in 1994. Additionally, uh, the applicant seeks designation of the project site as an urban development action area project or UDAP for tax abatement purposes, along with an associated disposition. And just to conclude, here is a view uh, of the project site looking uh, towards uh, the Northeast. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions, Vice Chair Knuckles. Has a developer been selected yet? Yes, they have. It is? Uh, sure, the Infinite Horizons. Infinite Horizons. That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Delos. I, I think MBD has a role in this project as well though, right? They do. One of the principles of uh, Infinite Horizons actually is a former MDB person, so yes. Okay, when, certainly when it comes back, I'd like to know more about the relationship sure. um, between the development partners, that would be helpful. Um, and you've answered most of my questions about unit mix and AMI, so I really appreciate that and I appreciate you including the local AMI in your presentation since that's so critical. Um, do they already have a community facility partner selected? I mean, it's interesting that it would be seller first and second floor. Sure. Uh, I think that they are looking at options. I think a, a senior center was one of the options considered, but I don't think anything has been firmed up just yet. Okay. And the same, I guess, is for the retail. Is it been? <clears throat> right. Yeah, they're still, yeah, they're still early. looking. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Marin. Good afternoon. I noticed that you had either sale or lease. What is the intent do you think the city's lean towards? Do you know? Would you know? As far as the, the units? As far as disposition of the land. It's saying that it's either for sale or for lease. It looks it looks like, or is it was a sale or for lease referring to the individual units? So this is all rental. The, the units themselves are rental, but as far as the site itself, I can find out and get that for you. Yeah, because on one of the, the, the slide prior, it says you see the disposition by sale or lease. Can you go back a slide, sure. James? Sure. How they've been doing your leases. That might be that might be um, standard language for the disposition, but we can find out what their intent is. Thank you. It, it is for sale. It's for, yeah. for sale. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, Commissioner Levin. Yeah, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the 45 foot height limit. Is that um, a planning notion from 
another time? That's a good way to put it. So back when the URP was created, um, I think they were thinking more kind of lower scale. So thinking more like kind of a Charlotte Garden sort of thing as mm -hmm. opposed to like more density and height. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and has the community, local community, been consulted yet about making this change to the urban renewal plan? They did go to the community board. So they're on, yeah. they're at least aware that this is coming. And actually, James, could you go back to the site, um, the slide where you show what has already been built in the, under the urban renewal plan? If we look at each of these, they are also markedly taller than 45 right. feet and set the precedent of on significant development. Yeah, no, I raising. understand, but they're also at the uh, other side, other end, sort of higher density end of the urban renewal area. Um, and I just noticed that the um, language in the urban renewal plan um, says that development is supposed to be compatible with or beneficial to the surrounding community. So that's what triggered my question about whether the community is um, has been consulted in this so far. They have, yeah. And the, the this removal of the high cap, um, multiple sites have had this, and it's sort of been over time a mechanism used to allow more density and, yeah, right. to allow more development. Or at least more height, because we're not, it's not changing the right, density, more right? more height. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Well, then the application is certified. Thank you. Okay. The second item on our agenda, Page 12 is a certification of a UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned property in Brooklyn Community District 5. Alexandra Patty Diaz is here to present. Good afternoon, commissioners. The New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development proposes an urban development action area designation and urban development action area project approval and disposition of three vacant city-owned properties to facilitate the construction of three buildings with approximately 46 rental units of affordable housing in Brooklyn. Two project areas are located within the East New York rezoning area. A portion of, uh, pro of project site three, it's not included in the disposition because it's, it has already been disposed by the commission. The cluster is in the north central area of East New York, neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 5. Project area one is located at 190 Essex Street. Project area two is located at 223 227 Vermont Street. Project area three is located at 581 and 583 Vermont Avenue. Project area one and two, as said before, are within the East New York rezoning area. I'm going to walk you through each of the sites. Project area one, it's located at 190, 190 Essex Street, which is in the west side of Essex Street, within an R5 zoning district. Land uses within the area include a mix of residential, commercial, public facility, and institution. Other zoning districts within the area include R6A and R6B along Fulton Avenue, and R8A lo located along Atlantic Avenue. EC, EC6 districts is, lo is located along Fulton Street. A C24 commercial overlay is located along the portions of Fulton Street and Atlantic Avenue. Project area one is served by numerous public facilities and institutions, such as PS 108 and Liberty Avenue Middle School, as well as numerous churches. Esperandeo Brothers Playground is located two blocks west of the project site, which is also accessible with public transportation. The Cleveland Street J subway station is located three blocks northwest of the project site. Local bus service within the area include Q24 bus. The development site one is a vacant lot of approximately 9,800 square feet with a 50 feet of street frontage along Essex Street. The Essex Street building will be a three-story walk-up building with approximately 15 units. The building will have a total floor area of approximately 13,000 square feet and a total height of approximately 30 feet. The entrance of the building will be through Essex Street. An outdoor recreational open space at the rear of the, 
of approximately 5,200 square feet will be provided to all tenants. Two street, street, two street trees will be planted. Amenities of the building will include laundry facilities, storage, and bicycle parking spaces that, we, that will be located on the ground floor. The proposed development will include one bedroom and two bedroom units. Typical floor plans include three one bedroom units and two two bedroom units. Project area two to the left side of the slide is located at 223 227 Vermont Street, which is on the east side of Vermont Street. Within an M14 R6A, a special mixed use district 16, and an R5 zoning district. Land uses within the area include a mix of residential, commercial, public facility, uh, institutions, industrial and manufacturing, and parking spaces given its proximity to the East New York IBZ. Other zoning districts within the area include R6B within, uh, between Liberty and Atlantic Avenue, RAA, C44D, and EC5 districts along Atlantic Avenue as well, and MX16, EC5, and an R5B districts are located on Glenmore Avenue. 27 Penn Ave Pennsylvania Avenue, which uh, it's becoming a future community center where Community Board 5 youth programs and NYPD office will coexist in the same building. It's located on two blocks west of the project site. Um, this was part of the initiative of the East New York rezoning. Um, and this area also includes, includes numerous public facilities and institutions, um, such as the William Maxwell High School and several churches. The project site two is also accessible, accessible uh, by public transportation. Liberty Avenue C subway station is located two blocks west of the site. Uh, the area is also served by several bus routes, B20, B83, and Q24. Development site two is vacant. Is a vacant city-owned lot of approximately 7,900 square feet and approximately 75 feet of frontage along Vermont Street. The Vermont Street building will be a four-story walk-up building with approximately 15 units. The building will, ha will have a total floor area of approximately 13,000 square feet, reaching a total height of approximately 39 feet. The entrance of the building will be on Vermont Street. Vermont Street. The outdoor recreational open the outdoor recreational open space at the rear yard of approximately 4,400 square feet will be provided to all tenants. Three street trees will be planted. Amenities in the building will include laundry facility that will be located on the first floor. The proposed development will include one bedroom and two bedroom units. Typical floor plans include two one bedroom units and two two bedroom units. Project area three, the south side of the slide, is located uh, in just outside the East New York rezoning area. It's located at 581 and 583 Belmont Ave Avenue, which is north si in the north side of Belmont Avenue, within an R5 zoning district. Land uses within the surrounding area include a mix of residential, commercial, public facility, and institutions, as well as several open spaces. Others, other zoning districts within the area include an R7A located north of the project site, along Pinkett Avenue, and the EC5 district located between Pitkin and Belmont Avenues. C23 and C24 commercial overlays are located along portions of Pitkin and Sutter Avenues. Project Area 3 is served by numerous educational facilities, such as PS158 Warwick. Sutter Ball Fields is located in front of the project site, south of Belmont Avenue. The area is also accessible by public transportation. The Van Sinclair Avenue C subway station is located three blocks northwest of the project site. 
local bus services within the area include the B14 bus. Development side three has a lot area of approximately 10,000 square feet and then approximately 100 feet of frontage on Belmont Avenue. The Belmont Avenue building will be a three-story walk-up building with approximately 15 affordable units. The proposed building will have a total floor area of approximately 12,500 square feet and a total height of approximately 30 feet. The entrance of the building will be on Belmont Avenue. Amenities of the building include laundry facility that will be located on the ground floor, an outdoor recreational open space at the rear yard of approximately 5,600 square feet will be provided to all tenants. Eight street streets will be planted. The proposed development will include one bedroom and two bedroom units. Typical floor plans include four one bedroom units and two two bedroom units. HPD proposes a UDAP designation private approval, a disposition of city on site um, to a, develop a developer selected by HPD. I'm open to answer any questions. Questions from the commission? Commissioner De La Luz. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. It's nice to see these smaller infill projects. Um, do we know what the AMI mixture is or the intended financing, source of financing? Yes, HPD provided the following breakdown. For each of the buildings, 30% huh? AMI at 80%, 40% of AMI at 20%, 50% of AMI at 11%, 60% of AMI at 38%, and 70% of AMI at 13%. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, the application is certified. Thank you. <clears throat> Item number three, page 46, is a certification of a site selection and acquisition in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Lilia Carrier. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a proposed action by the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services for site selection acquisition for property by the New York, by the City of New York for assignment to parks. Spring Creek Park is located in the East New York neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 5. Mm -hmm. Spring Creek Park is 105 acres of undeveloped salt marsh in North Jamaica Bay. It was originally acquired during the construction of the Shore Parkway in 1938. The park was assigned um, more city-owned land in 1992, 1994, and 2001. Upon acquisition of the proposed sites, parks will move forward with, the plan to, uh, with, the, with plans to improve and restore the ecosystem of Spring Creek Park. The project is part of a larger preservation project led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. South of the Shore Parkway, at the mouth of Spring Creek, other parkland is managed by the U.S. National Park Services as part of the Gateway National Parkway Recreation Area and managed by the New York State, by New York State as Shirley, Shirley Chisholm State Park, which was designated in 2018 and will open the summer of 2019. To the west of the project area is the Gateway Center, a major commercial hub in the area, as well as the former Brooklyn Development Center, which is currently being redeveloped into mixed-use residential and commercial by the New York State Urban Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. The immediate surrounding area is marshland and open space, as well as multifamily residences zoned R4 east of the project site in Lindenwood. The project area is located on one tax block, four lots, and a portion of Drew Street in the Spring Creek neighborhood of East New York, Brooklyn. Three of the four proposed project sites and Drew Street are surrounded by existing parkland. And one lot is surrounded by parkland on three sides and 75th Street along the eastern border. 
The proposed project area consists of four privately owned, vacant, and unimproved lots and a portion of Drew Street that is mapped but unbuilt, which is between three of the lots. Spring Creek and the subject properties are dominated by urban fill and invasive vegetation. Um, some photos of the project site. So in image one, it's a view north across the extension of 157th Avenue. Uh, image two is a view northwest across the extension of 157th Avenue. And images three and four are views east um, to 75th Street. Parks and DCAS seek approval for site selection and acquisition by the City of New York for four lots and an unbuilt, privately owned portion of Drew Street. The, project, the proposed project is consistent with the existing land uses, will preserve the subject properties as parkland, and facilitate ecological recreation within the Spring Creek Park. That concludes my presentation. If you have any questions. Questions. This is a quick one. The application is certified. Item number four, uh, page 54, is a pre-hearing review of an acquisition to facilitate the continued use of a child care facility in Brooklyn Community District 5. Uh, Lilia uh, is again our presenter. Okay, uh, good afternoon again. Uh, this is a proposed action by the New York City Administration of Ch Children's Services and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for public facility acquisition to facilitate a lease renewal for the continued use of 370 new lots as a child care facility. The City Planning Commission previously approved the application for acquisition on February 10th, 1992. The child care facility is located in the East New York neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 5 at 370 New Lots Avenue. The project site is located on the southwest corner of New Lots Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue in an R6 zoning district. The surrounding land use is predominantly residential <coughs> with one and two family as well as multifamily buildings. The child care facility consists of a two-story building including a side play yard, play yard area and has been occupied as a child care center since 1972. DCP toured the child care facility on October 3rd, 2018 with ACS and confirmed the building is clean, friendly, and with no visible issues. The company Soap of Work addresses any life cycle issues the building has. And we have some images of the interior of the building, main entry and kitchen, classroom, and play areas. Uh, several suggested improvements for urban design along Pennsylvania and New Lots Avenue frontage have been incorporated into the scope of work, including repainting the entrance floor as a child-friendly design, the use of gl uh, glass entry doors where possible, and the provision of adding a translucent and colorful material at the chain link fence. ACS and DCAS seek approval for a public facility acquisition to facilitate a lease renewal for the continued use of 370 New Lots Avenue as a child care facility. DCAS um, is in the process of negotiating a 10-year long-term lease with two five-year renewals. The community board voted to approve the application with 26 in favor. The borough president also approved the application with no modifications. The applicant team is scheduled to present to CPC on December 27th. Questions? Okay, then we'll see this at a public hearing on Wednesday. Item five, uh, page 77, is a pre-hearing review of an acquisition, acquisition to facilitate the continued use of a child care facility in Brooklyn Community District 8. Our presenter is Kevin Kraft. Good afternoon, commissioners. ACS and DCAS are seeking a public facility acquisition for a lease renewal for the continued use of the Friends of Crown Heights 9 Child Care Center. The City Planning Commission previously approved an application for acquisition in October of 1992. And in April of 1999, the City executed the current 20-year lease that will expire this April. As you may recall, the center is located in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 8, just a few blocks north of Eastern Parkway. The center is located on Sterling Place between Nostrand and Rogers Avenues within an R6A zoning district in a predominantly residential area with commercial uses concentrated along Rogers and Nostrand Avenues. 
The center is well served by public transit located within a few blocks of the two, three, and four train lines and multiple bus lines. The child care center consists of a two-story building including a rooftop play area that has been occupied as a child care center since 1971. The center is open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and serves up to 180 children ages two to five years old with 39 full and part-time staff. DCP staff toured the facility with ACS and daycare center staff on October 11, 2018 and confirmed the facility was in a state of good repair and fully sprinklered. Here are some images of a typical classroom space as well as the rooftop play area and the first floor hallway. Again, a second floor classroom, the main entrance lobby, as well as a kitchen space. Um, to improve the building's appearance, ACS has included multiple urban design enhancements as part of their scope of work. Um, and Community Board 8 held a public hearing on this item and recommended approving the application 32 in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstaining. On January 7, 2019, the Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing on this item. There were no speakers, and the BP recommended approving with no modifications or conditions. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions? I'll just note that with this um, application now, which will go to a public hearing on Wednesday, this completes an entire cycle of renewals. And I want to thank the commission because there have been significant advances. These might not be the most glamorous, but boy, do they figure heavily in the lives of the users of the ACS and the DIFTA facilities. And I'm especially pleased that the commission was able, one, to get so much more sprinkling done, and secondly, um, to work with our urban design team and DCAS and come up with scopes of works that address the physical character, the welcoming nature of these facilities. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, and I do want to call out Sarah Whitman, who is hidden in the corner of the room. She is the member of the city planning team that has shepherded all of these through. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> she, she shepherded. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the day's work. Item six, uh, page 104, is a pre-hearing review of a UDAP designation disposition of city-owned property zoning map and zoning text amendments and an amendment to an urban renewal plan in Brooklyn Community District 3. Uh, in her debut before the City Planning Commission is Karina Leong. Hi. So this application, this is an application by HPD and DTF Atlantic, which is a joint venture between Daybar Development and Thoroughbird. And um, once again, they're requesting for actions versus to amend the Saratoga Square Urban Renewal Plan to allow residential and commercial uses on certain sites that the plan has designated uh, for industrial use. Second is for a UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned property. Third is for a zoning map amendment to rezone part of an M11R7D district to R8A with a C24 overlay. And lastly, they want to map MIH option one on that rezoned area. These actions would facilitate the construction of a mixed-use building with 235 affordable residential units, as well as ground floor commercial and community facility space that includes an aquaponics education center. This project is located in the southeast corner of the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood in Brooklyn CD3, just north of Ocean Hill and Crown Heights. The development site fronts on Atlantic Avenue with the LIRR running at grade here along the middle of Atlantic. Um, the surrounding area has a mix of uses and would be characterized as a low to medium density residential neighborhood with some heavy commercial and light industrial uses along parts of Atlantic. The site is well served by transit uh, with a local subway stop on the AC lines and two bus lines a couple blocks away. Oops. Here you have the development site outlined in red. HBD controls all of the lots here except for the three outlined in yellow, which are controlled by the developers. The entire site is vacant except for two unoccupied buildings on the privately owned lots. You can see uh, the development site here from Atlantic on the left and from one of the side streets on the right. On this slide, you can see what the side streets look like and you have the development site here uh, marked in red. 
This is what Atlantic looks, looks like near the site. So on the left, you can see that the LIRR is behind the fence when it's at grade in front of the site. And then it elevates to the west of the site, which you can see on the right. The development that's proposed for this site will be about 216,000 square feet, which is 7.17 FAR. The building rises to 14 stories at Long Atlantic and then drops to six stories on the mid block. So what you're seeing here basically reaches the limit of the bulk that's allowed for the proposed R8A zoning. There will be 235 apartments and 44 parking spaces with 28 of those for the residents, as well as 108 bike parking spots for residents. HBD is going to be doing the ELO program with option one, so all units will be affordable at 100% AMI and below with set-asides for formerly homeless households and low and very low income bands. The building will also be built to enterprise green community standards. The ground floor of the development will include a grocery store, which is shown in red. And then the green areas are the community facility spaces, uh, which will be the aquaponics education center, an art gallery, a neighborhood resources center, and an office with services to support the residents transitioning from homelessness. And then lastly, the blue areas are for residential use. So to facilitate the, the proposed development, HPD requests to amend the Saratoga Square Urban Renewal Plan, which is, was adopted in 1992, is in effect until 2032. The plan had designated the city-owned properties on the development site for industrial use, which only allows certain uses that are permitted in M11 districts. So HPD is requesting to amend the plan to change the, the designation of these sites to allow for residential and commercial use. HBD is also requesting a UDAP designation and approval for the entire development site shown here in red, as well as a disposition of the city owned lots to the developers, um, which is the area that is hatched. Together, HBD and DTF Atlantic are proposing a zoning map amendment to remove the MX-10 special district zoning on the development site and to change the underlying M11R7D zoning to R8A with a C24 overlay along Atlantic extending 100 feet deep, uh, which would increase the residential FAR allowed from 5.6 to 7.2 with inclusionary housing. And then lastly, um, the applicants are proposing to map MIH option one on the rezoned area. This application was certified on November 13th last year. Community board three held a public hearing on the application on January 7th, and all 39 members present voted in favor of the application. The borough president held a public hearing on January 23rd, um, but we're still waiting on their recommendation. And then the CPC public meeting is scheduled for February 27th, and there's a deadline to vote by April 22nd. Um, thank you, I will now take any questions that you have. <coughs> Vice Chair Knuckles. On the disposition site, um, there is a portion of it is a private site that's occupied by a, an occupied, um, what does it say? An occupied two-story single family house. Uh, do we know, uh, are those occupants uh, owners or are they, ten or are they tenants? And if they're tenants, do they have any uh, preference as it relates to... Um, uh, um, the buildings are actually unoccupied. Both? Yeah. Because the report yeah. says one is unoccupied. Um. The, the, I mean, that may have been, that may have been the case the at, the, at the time of certification. It may have been the case at the time of certification, and, and now that they've... They've since confirmed that the confirmed buildings are that unoccupied. Out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Delos. Um First, uh, welcome for your first presentation. Um, so... Did HPD, I'm just wondering, given the fact that it was an urban renewal area that had um, been designated for industrial use, do you, is there any history that we have about attempts um, to redevelop on, with the industrial uses during that time? Um, this is a perfectly fine use. I certainly appreciate the community board's support. I'm just wondering if there's a little more backstory here. 
Uh, I can ask the applicant to speak to that on Wednesday. Other comments? Then the application will be heard at a public hearing on Wednesday. Item seven, page 168, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Queens Community District 1. Our presenter is Blake Monte. Good afternoon, Chair Lago, commissioners. This is a private application to facilitate the development of a mixed residential and commercial building in Astoria Community District 1, Queens. The owner of a development site at 4715 34th Avenue is applying to rezone an area from medium density R5 and R6B districts and an auto-oriented C81 district to higher density R7X and R6B districts with a C24 commercial overlay. They are also applying to map a new mandatory inclusionary housing area. The requested actions would allow for a new 12-story building with about 201 total residential units, including about 61 affordable units. This would include space for community facility uses and a small retail space on the ground floor. The rezoning area is located near the intersection of 34th Avenue and Northern Boulevard, northeast of Sunnyside Yard, southwest of Woodside Houses, and near the Steinway Street and 46th Street m &R subway stations. 34th Avenue is a wide street as defined by the zoning resolution and is a neighborhood retail corridor. There are established medium density residential streets located to the north of the rezoning area and Northern Boulevard is a major arterial road with automotive uses and big box retail. The development site is one of many large uh, non-residential sites along Northern Boulevard and the Department of City Planning finds that supporting new residential development on these sites better aligns with the city's and community's vision for Northern Boulevard than the existing auto-oriented uses. This portion of Northern Boulevard is also quite wide and is located near multiple subway stations, making these sites opportune locations for the city to support the development of new, higher density buildings with affordable housing and without displacing current residents. Looking at the, re the rezoning area from Northern Boulevard, the development site is shown here on the right and the block 722 portion of the rezoning area is shown here on the left in yellow. The development site is currently occupied by three one and two story commercial buildings with an automotive repair shop, a fast food restaurant, a tutoring center, and a house of worship. The block 722 portion of the rezoning area includes two commercial and light industrial buildings on the south eastern corner of block 722 and three three-story multifamily row houses. The applicant proposes a zoning map amendment to replace a current C81 district with R7X on the block 723 portion of the rezoning area and R6B on the southeastern corner of the block 722 portion of the rezoning area. The entirety of the rezoning area would include a C24 commercial overlay. The proposed zoning treatment would allow for higher density uh, fronting Northern Boulevard with a step down to lower scale neighborhood context to the north and west. I do want to take a moment to underscore why the Department of City Planning recommended that the applicant include a portion of Block 722 in the rezoning area. With the proposed boundaries, the, C the current C81 district would be shifted uh, east to 48th Street. Um, and if the rezoning area were not, it, it would not be limited, sorry, if the rezoning area is not limited to the development site, an island of C81 shown here in blue would remain in place. With the requested actions, the applicant is also required to map a new mandatory inclusionary housing area over a portion of the rezoning area. The applicant proposes mandatory inclusionary housing option one, requiring that 30% of the residential floor area be reserved for permanently affordable housing. This would be reserved for an average household income of about 80% area median income. Queens Community Board 1 held two public hearings for this application on January 9th and January 15th and voted 30, 31 to 4 on January 15th to recommend disapproval of the proposed actions based on concerns that the proposed R7X district is out of scale with the surrounding context and would prefer instead an 8 to 10 story maximum height along Northern Boulevard. 
They're also concerned that the addition of a large number of new market rate residential units uh, would raise local rents and property values and, and could displace residents and businesses in the area. They request that the commercial overlay that's proposed as part of this application be restricted to local service uses, and they're concerned that the depth of the proposed overlay uh, would allow for an encroachment into the, the residential neighborhood to the north, and they would prefer that this be, that, that the depth be reduced. Um, the community also uh, uh, is concerned that the proposed mandatory inclusionary housing option one uh, does not actually reflect local incomes, uh, and they request instead mandatory inclusionary housing option one for the rezoning area, and they're requesting that the developer reserve 35% of the residential floor area for affordable housing. They're also concerned that the proposed unit mix does not include enough two and three bedroom units. Following the community board's vote, the applicant made a series of modifications, uh, and this includes a reduction in the total building height from 14 stories to 12 stories, replacing nine uh, studio and one bedroom units with two and three bedroom units, uh, and made a commitment to reserve two thirds of the affordable housing uh, for households at, at an average of 60% area median income. They've also committed to reserve space for a preschool within the building. However, it's important to note that these modifications would not be enforceable by these proposed actions. Queensboro President Melinda Katz uh, held a public hearing on January 31st and recommends uh, approval on the condition that the applicant remains committed to their proposed modifications, that the height of the proposed building be reduced further, uh, that the applicant provide more affordable housing than what is required by mandatory inclusionary housing, and that the applicant continue to work with the community to address their concerns. This image il illustrates the revised 12-story building envelope compared with the 14-story building envelope that would be allowed in the proposed R7X district. The applicant pre previously proposed a 14-story tower at the intersection of 34th Avenue and 48th Street with a lower base along 47th Street. They've revised their building design to raise the building height along 47th Street to overall reduce the tower by two stories. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Levin. <coughs> Um, yes, Blake, thank you for your comments at the beginning of your presentation about um, city planning's thoughts about the appropriateness of um, larger scale <coughs> residential such as this. Has there been um, a, any kind of a community planning effort for this area? I know there's a <coughs> quite a stretch of the C81 that looks like it would fall into, in, invite the same sort of um, rezoning attention not been a community planning effort here. Okay. Um, is the R7X something that the, is consistent with the city, Department of City Planning's thoughts for this area? Did you, yeah. in, the, in the push and pull with the applicant, <laughs> um, or, or is the agency and the applicant in the same place on what the appropriate scale here is? Uh, we are comfortable with, the, with a 14-story building in this location. Okay. Other questions? Okay, we'll see this on Wednesday. Thank you. Item eight, page 198, is a pre-hearing review of zoning map and zoning text amendments in Bronx Community District 9. Our presenter is Manny Lagaris. Uh, for the record, I'm noting that Commissioner Moran is recused on this <coughs> item. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this application is coming back for pre-hearing review. If you recall, it was certified last month on January 7th. The applicant is the Azimuth Development Group, LLC, and they're requesting a zoning map amendment from R5 to R7A C24, as well as a zoning text amendment to Appendix F, the zoning resolution, to designate the rezoning area as an MIH area. The project is located in the Union Port section of Bronx Community District Number 9 on Block 3797, Lot 
1933. The surrounding area is predominantly residential, uh, two, three stories, one and two family homes, as well as pockets of uh, multiple dwellings. Uh, the transportation is very good in the area, a lot of bus service, even three bus lines that go down to Midtown. These are some photographs. You're looking northeast at the site, which is approximately 61,000 square feet, contains a uh, one-story vacant, uh, formerly house of worship, uh, 10,200 square feet. That's another, but you're looking uh, northwest at the site. Uh, the zoning, R5 zoning, has a maximum height of 40 feet, maximum FAR of 1.25, so you can't build the uh, multiple dwellings that he wants to put up with the two buildings. The R7A does allow him to do that with a maximum height of 95 feet, and also the establishment of the C24 commercial overlay, which will allow for the proposed commercial uses. Uh, the total uh, number of dwelling units, two, uh, 330 units. Uh, the applicant is, has chosen option one, which is 25% of the total units uh, to uh, households at 60% of AMI or below, with 10% at 40% uh, AMI and below. Uh, the site plan here indicates the two buildings that he's proposing to build. Building A, proposed seven-story building with 65 home ownership units. These will be cooperative uh, units under HPD's Open Door Program. Uh, the other building, Building B, will contain 265 dwelling units on floors two through nine, also commercial uses on the ground floor. Uh, he's providing accessory uh, parking, 159 spaces at and below grade. These are the renderings uh, of what Building B will look like. And this is the rendering of what Building A will look like. <laughs> Community Board number nine voted in favor of the application by a vote of 21 in favor, one opposed, one abstention, with the following conditions. Uh, condition that the applicant set aside parking for the commercial uh, users. Also to uh, set aside uh, space for seniors and veterans uh, within the uh, commercial areas. Also ensure that one-fourth of the construction jobs go to CD9 residents as well to contribute yearly uh, to neighboring schools and to sponsor local community groups and to commit uh, to high quality buildings as service jobs with wages and benefits. The Bronx Borough President approved the application without any conditions. However, uh, he made the following comments. Uh, his comments that he supports HPD's open door program, which brings housing to the Bronx, which he believes is uh, has the lowest uh, throughout the city. So he's very grateful for that. At the same time, he says that HPD's uh, minimum lot sizes are very restrictive, and he would like to see larger units, especially two uh, bedroom and three bedroom units. Uh, he uh, credits the applicant with providing zero studios in Building B, uh, suggests landscaping uh, or green roof on Building B. This, uh, assist, let me just go back to that slide here. Building B, seven story, and it steps down to five stories as it gets nearer to the residential buildings. Uh, he's stating that these, these rooftop areas where you can actually look out your windows, you have some type of landscaping. Uh, also, that uh, uh, retailers should be prohibited from uh, uh, having signs that are very high and will, pro uh, will distract the drivers that are going along the Bruckner Expressway, as well as impacting uh, the surrounding residential uses. Uh, he also suggests uh, that a roof be, would, a roof covering the um, parking area. That's the one that's at gray. Uh, he would like to see a roof there. Uh, and that's uh, basically what the, his concerns were. Are there any questions? I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions from the commission? Oh, then we'll see this on Wednesday. Thank okay, you. Thank you so much. Item nine, page 235, is a pre-hearing review of zoning map and zoning text amendments, uh, non-residential disposition of city-owned property, uh, UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned property in Staten Island Community District 1. Our presenters are Joe Helferty and the newly appointed director of the Staten Island office, Christopher Hadwin. Thank you. Uh, 
Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Joe Halperty of the Staten Island Office for the Department of City Planning, and I'm here to present to you today a series of applications that were previously certified on November 13th on behalf of the department. It's coming. Thank you. <laughs> on behalf of the Department of City Planning, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Uh, additionally, since certification, uh, two additional amended applications have since been submitted to the com Commission at the beginning of this month. So as a brief overview of the objectives of the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan, uh, the guiding principles of this plan were set forward through our public outreach that took place over the past several years. Uh, they involve <clears throat> seeking to create a vibrant, resilient downtown environment, support the creation of new housing for the broad spectrum of the North Shore's needs, support the existing and new businesses, as well as additional commercial development in the corridor, and align the investment in infrastructure, open space, and services with the strategic growth of Staten Island's North Shore. Uh, so I'll briefly provide a review uh, overview of the land use and zoning objectives uh, that we presented to you uh, November 13th. So first, the rezoning areas for Bay Street and Canal Street are highlighted here in red. Um, so to the, the, the northern uh, rezoning area here, it's Bay Street Corridor, currently today zoned M11. As you can see from this map, areas to the north, east, and south are all zoned C42, permitting mixed use uh, commercial and residential development, as well as well-established lower density residential areas to the west of the Bay Street rezoning area. Uh, today, as it's zoned M11, it precludes the creation of residential units and is somewhat out of context with the type of development that's occurring uh, in the surroundings. Uh, to the south is the Canal Street rezoning area. Uh, today, zoned R32C22 and R4C22. Um, and this is the primary connector between uh, Tappan Park to the north and Broad Street in the Stapleton NYCHA campus to the south. Uh, and this is a lower density mixed use zoning that is out of context with that of the larger uh, Stapleton uh, neighborhood. Uh, so the land use and zoning strategy for uh, the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan focuses primarily on these four areas. First, the Bay Street Corridor uh, to encourage medium density mixed use development. Uh, second, the Canal Street Corridor, um, trying to encourage the same medium density mixed use development. Uh, third, along the special Stapleton waterfront um, to the east of the Bay Street rezoning, uh, we'd seek an amendment to the special district. And lastly, uh, taking a closer look at city-owned property, exploring opportunities for the creation of housing and jobs in the area. So with regard to the Bay Street Corridor rezoning, uh, again, it's currently zoned M11 today. Uh, and the applications before the commission seek to rezone the northern portion uh, to R6, C24, uh, as is due to its proximity to the St. George Special District and transit. Uh, the remainder of the corridor would be rezoned R6, C23, um, with portions of R6B, C23, and R6B fronting Van Duzer Street as a transition into the lower density residential neighborhoods. Uh, additionally, the application seeks to modify height, density, and use uh, through the creation of the Special Bay Street Corridor District. So uh, as a high level overview, some of the provisions of this special district, um, which are designed to encourage the kind of vision of this plan, which was to create this continuous pedestrian uh, commercial corridor connecting St. George to Stapleton, um, put in place uh, special regulations for use, uh, such as requiring commercial uses within 50 feet of Bay Street, as well as portions that are optional along Van Duzer, uh, and allowing the flexibility in building envelopes for the creation of additional services and jobs in the area, such as permitting second story uh, office uses or, or community facility uses within the area and allowing for wholly commercial office buildings. Uh, additionally, the, <clears throat> pardon me, um, additionally, the special district seeks to allow, uh, the application that was previously certified sought to allow the expansion of continuation of certain M uses in the area as well as the uh, allowing physical cultural establishments to be as of right. Uh, the special district also sought to modify bulk regulations, which would permit buildings generally between five and eight stories throughout the majority of the area, with buildings of up to 12 and 14 stories on select sites. Uh, these FARs would range from 2.2, adjacent to the lower density residential neighborhoods to the west, uh, up to 4.6 on sites that are located closer to the St. George Special District, which today allows for buildings of up to 20 stories tall. 
In addition to ensure that the goals of creating this uh, continuous pedestrian environment are met, uh, there's special streetscape regulations proposed in the district, such as requiring articulation of the street wall, ground floor transparency requirements, and streetscape elements uh, that would be required for any building that elevates uh, to the flood zone. Additionally, parking provisions are proposed to be modified to meet the objectives of the plan, such as uh, permitting up to 0.5 FAR of local retail uses to be exempt from parking requirements and allowing a greater range of uh, parking provisions such as the ability to site spaces uh, off of the zoning lot, anywhere within the district, and uh, restrict curb cuts along Bay Street. So at the time of certification, the commission asked for a bit of background into how this 0.5 FAR commercial floor area waiver would, would operate. Um, so first are the goals of the commercial development and parking regulations uh, in the area. So firstly, we'd like to encourage the continuous uh, local retail corridor from St. George to Stapleton. Uh, second, we would like to ensure that there is a certain flexibility in the zoning that does not preclude the creation of the services and jobs that we've heard from the community that they need. Uh, and lastly, we'd like to balance this commercial development with the need to generate housing in the area to support both current and future businesses. So as it's proposed, um, the zoning text would permit a 0.5 FAR uh, exemption for commercial parking with the exception of use group 6B, which is uh, largely considered office uses. Um, and again, the special district itself uh, requires non-residential ground floors as well as allows for the provisions for uh, second story commercial and non-residential uses. So as you can see here in the first uh, scenario, which takes a look at what the underlying parking regulations would be, um, we've selected a representative site to demonstrate how a mixed building may work if they try to take advantage of and maximize the commercial floor area through the provisions in this uh, special district. So the commercial ground floor would be having to provide a certain degree of parking, as well as the small portion of office use on the second story. Um, you can see from the lower uh, left-hand image and plan view that the majority of the area behind the lot, the lot area, um, would be comprised of commercial parking, which would limit the amount of area need, uh, that would be required for the residential parking and thus limit the number of residential units created. So through our proposal to exempt a certain portion of the floor area, you can see that it still allows for this continuous ground floor retail experience. However, it allows the proposed development to maximize uh, the second story office uses. So the area is still, uh, the area to the left is still providing a certain degree of commercial parking. In this example, it's uh, 33 spaces. However, it could be shared amongst both uses, um, specifically since the office uses are more likely to be generating traffic from outside of the kind of local community. Uh, so in total, uh, to, in summary, the Bay Street Corridor Special District would permit buildings between eight and six stories, uh, with select sites being able to achieve higher densities while ensuring that it preserves views towards the waterfront. Um, and additional regulations we put in place to ensure a quality pedestrian experience, such as ground floor transparency, limitation of curb cuts, and visual corridors in the area. Um, so since certification uh, the earlier, uh, sorry, at the end of January, uh, an amended application was filed uh, which sought to amend the special Bay Street Corridor District uh, based on community feedback and feedback from the commission at certification. So the first of these provisions is to expand the use provisions for breweries that were uh, initially established in the application certified on the 13th of November. Uh, at that time, it allowed for the limited expansion of existing breweries within the district, um, which there was uh, one, one brewery on a site that was permitted to expand in the future. Uh, the A application would allow for up to uh, 30,000 square feet of brewery use to exist as of right anywhere within the district, uh, allowing for the creation of new breweries in either mixed buildings or standard alone commercial buildings. Uh, as one of the rec uh, stipulations would be that it involves a accessory uh, eating or drinking establishment so it can continue to participate in the kind of more vibrant um, streetscape of the district. The second modification um, seeks to look at the loading requirements that would be required for the R6 uh, district with a C2 commercial overlay. So currently today, the loading berth requirements for uh, this type of zoning regulation are more closely aligned with that of a lower density uh, commercial district, such as an R3 or R4, than they are with districts that are of this, this density. Um, so this is an underlying provision that is citywide. However, uh, the Special Bay Street Corridor District is trying to align this to ensure that 
you know, a development is able to take full advantage of the commercial development provisions and balance it with the requirements for providing offsite parking, uh, the constraints of developing in the flood, plo uh, flood plain, and the, um, the general cost constraints of providing structured parking. So today, uh, the first loading berth in the R6C2 district would be required after 8,000 square feet. Uh, through the modification, which would seek to uh, seek the regulations for an R7 district, that first loading berth would be required at 25,000 square feet. And lastly, the special district is, seeks to modify the design standards for visual corridors. So at the time of certification, these were described as being designed to the minimum standard of a DOT street. Uh, the A application seeks to provide a little bit of flexibility to allow for these visual corridors to be used to, for the creation of public space. Um, it allows obstructions such as planting, seating, and unenclosed commercial, uh, unenclosed accessory uses to the development to exist within these uh, visual corridors. So moving on to Canal Street. Uh, again, Canal Street's highlighted here in the center. It's these uh, small one block area that connects the Tappan Park uh, kind of center of Stapleton to the north with the Stapleton houses and Broad Street commercial corridor to the south. Uh, today it's zoned for mixed use, uh, lower density mixed use zoning, uh, which traditionally doesn't support the kind of density that you would expect to see uh, or is appropriate for the context of the Stapleton neighborhood. So the application seeks to take the area zoned R32, C22, and R4, C22, and proposes a rezoning to R6B, C23, which would allow buildings with maximum of five stories and an FAR of 2.2. In addition, the rezoning areas would both be identified as mandatory inclusionary housing areas. Uh, the application before the commission identifies that all four MIH options be made available to future development in the rezonings. The special Stapleton Waterfront District, uh, where we are seeking to a text amendment, uh, this is largely in response to the uh, feedback that we heard from the community throughout our outreach. So this was um, largely a response to the building form of the initial phase of this development, uh, which is very short um, and has very strict street wall requirements that are generally considered as you know cutting off the community from the waterfront. So as a, at the time of certification, we had some questions about the overall plan uh, for the Stapleton waterfront, which uh, I can provide you a bit of background now. So uh, today, the uh, special Stapleton waterfront district has an FAR of two uh, with buildings with maximum height of 55 feet and a setback of eight feet. So a very uh, strict or very constrained building envelope. So the initial master plan that was laid out in this special Stapleton Waterfront District in 2006 uh, included three sub areas. So to the north, uh, parcel A, which is city owned land. Um, along the eastern side of Front Street is parcels B1 through B5, which are also under city jurisdiction. And then to the west of Front Street is parcel C, uh, which is a much smaller area, but is comprised largely of privately owned lots. Uh, in addition to these sub areas, the special district outlined three unique public open spaces that would be set aside, um, which I can show you a bit more detail of in a second. Um, but it's important to note that in 2017, the Areas D and E were mapped into the special state of the waterfront district to uh, facilitate development at 125 Edgewater Street. Um, so here's a brief overview of the open space planning that's taken place thus far at the Stapleton waterfront. So currently, uh, EDC is in the process of getting this reviewed uh, or pre preliminary review with the Public Design Commission and has already presented this to the community board, council member, and other elected officials. Uh, so here in the center, um, this is the portion of the waterfront that's currently built out today, which includes a portion of waterfront esplanade and this uh, element here with the cove, which is outlined as one of the three main elements of the open space plan. Uh, additional phases of open space are planned for north and, and south of this area. So to the south at phase two, you can see that there's a fair amount of uh, active or passive recreation trails uh, that connect areas such as barbecue areas, dog runs, playgrounds uh, through the larger open space network. And to the north of the existing development, uh, adjacent to parcels A and B1, which we're seeking uh, to, to modify through the text amendment that's before the commission, uh, the open space plan includes continuation of the passive 
uh, recreation network, as well as areas that are designated for sports fields and a public plaza existing between parcel B1 and B2, which is the uh, currently built area. So again, the text amendment that was initially certified sought to increase the maximum height of buildings from 55 feet to 125 feet on areas A and B1 to the north, um, but allowing no additional floor area, so there was the ability to vertically redistribute. Additionally, the text amendment sought to modify the street wall requirements uh, to provide greater flexibility to meet ADA and resiliency requirements. So since certification, an amended application has been submitted uh, before the commission, which would seek to exempt 100,000 square feet of floor area for a future school use on sub areas A or B1. So as you can see here for illustrative purposes, uh, how this may play out, um, the school building being identified here in purple. Uh, so the additional flexibility that's provided in the zoning envelope allows for buildings with tower portions that range from five to 12 stories, as well as allocating lot area for the creation of a potential future school when need arises in the area. Additionally, the applications seek the disposition of city-owned property at 55 Stuyvesant Place in the St. George neighborhood uh, to Economic Development Corporation for the purpose of creating jobs in St. George downtown core, as well as the Urban Development Action Area Project Disposition at the Jersey Street Sanitation Garage located at the intersection of Jersey Street and Victory Boulevard. Uh, so again, currently this facility houses the Department of Sanitation's North Shore uh, functions and is planned to be relocated in 2023. So the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, uh, initially at certification, was seeking an as of right development in the R5 C22 zoning district, which would facilitate a mixed building of approximately uh, 108 dwelling units. Based on feedback at uh, public review, uh, since then the application has been amended uh, to seek an affordable independent residence for seniors development on this site, which would increase the total number of residential units from 108 to 223. Uh, those 223 would include approximately 90 units set aside uh, specifically for heirs, as well as maintain area on the ground floor for commercial or community facility development. And you can see here uh, another illustrative rendering. Uh, the footprints of these buildings are largely the same as what was previously certified. Uh, however, it takes advantage of the as of right floor area and height increases provided to heirs. <clears throat> now um, onto environmental review. So previously, the draft environmental impact statement uh, was issued on November 9th prior to certification. And since then, a technical memorandum analyzing uh, the proposed actions of the A application, as well as the elements in the DEIS that were uh, identified to require uh, further analysis. Uh, so the following five categories were identified as uh, having the potential for significant adverse impacts. So again, in summary, uh, the actions before the commission today are intended to uh, facilitate the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan, uh, which aims to provide a walkable downtown environment connecting the St. George and Stapleton neighborhoods, and as well as provide housing and critical commercial needs throughout the area. In total, uh, with the amended applications, the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan can provide up to 1,800 new units of housing through the rezonings, 223 new units uh, through the disposition of property at the sanitation garage, um, over 1,000 jobs within the area, as well as 150,000 square feet of community facility, uh, which includes the potential future school at the Stapleton waterfront. And moving into public review. Um, so on January 8th, Community Board 1 held a public hearing and vote on all of the land use actions that we've just presented to you today. Uh, so with regard to the Bay Street Corridor, Canal Street Corridor rezonings, as well as the text amendments to establish the Bay Street Corridor Special District and Stapleton Waterfront District, the community board voted to disapprove with conditions. Uh, so in total, there were 12 conditions, uh, largely related to increased access to public open space, um, upgrade or maintenance to either existing infrastructure, such as the sewage treatment plant or traffic, um, as well as uh, uh, schools, and lastly, um, taking a closer look at the amount of parkland or open space being created uh, through, through our actions. 
Regarding the UDAP designation for the Jersey Street Sanitation Garage, the community board voted to approve with conditions. Uh, the first condition being that a full remediation of the site be conducted, and second, that the development include a daycare, supermarket, or community center use on its ground floor. And lastly, the action of the disposition of 55 Stuyvesant in place. The community board voted to approve with conditions and requested that the lease operator allocate a portion of approximately 20% uh, to a future maritime school or uh, library for the CUNY Extension Campus that's located in St. George. Um, following this, the application was referred to Borough President James Otto, um, who as of the 22nd of this month issued his following recommendation. Um, regarding the Bay Street Corridor, Canal Street Corridor, and tax amendments, uh, Borough President recommended to disapprove with conditions. So uh, in total there were 20 conditions which are included in your package, which are very thorough and thoughtful. Uh, in general, these are, these are around the themes of infrastructure, such as roads, sewers, drainage, um, and transportation infrastructure, uh, as well as schools. Uh, regarding the zoning proposal, um, the borough president recommends that we take a closer look at the exemption for the school use at Stapleton Waterfront, uh, as well as weighs in on uh, making all MIH options available for development throughout the area, and also comments on the need for childcare facilities. Uh, continued here uh, are additional recommendations uh, focused around the creation of programs, working groups, and oversight committees to ensure the success of the plan. Uh, the borough president also outlines his priorities for uh, development on city-owned sites, as well as his larger planning objectives uh, for the borough. Regarding the UDAP uh, dis designation for Jersey Street, the borough president voted to approve with conditions, uh, those conditions being that the development include the broadest range of affordable units, uh, ranging AMIs from 40 to 115 percent, and that uh, deed restrictions be incorporated so that design uh, requirements can be put in place, uh, as well as open space requirements for that future development. And lastly, we're regarding the disposition of 55 Stuyvesant in place, uh, borough president recommended to disapprove with conditions, uh, condition being that uh, EDC move forward on the previously released RFP to create a job incubator in the area and that it not include any housing and future development plans. Uh, and now I'd just like to provide a brief update on some of the elements of the neighborhood plan that we previously uh, had highlighted for the commission. So first, to uh, meet the plan's objectives of creating a vibrant and resilient downtown, I'd like to provide a little update on the work that's been done to uh, move forward the waterfront promenade from Stapleton to St. George and provide passive recreation, passive and active recreation along the waterfront. So as I previously uh, outlined, uh, there's a substantial amount of work being done along the waterfront to the south at the new Stapleton waterfront. But as you can see from this map here, this is actually just one piece in a much larger puzzle uh, that EDC is currently working on being able to uh, you know, craft this continuous waterfront esplanade throughout the area. So to the north, north of the Staten Island Ferry Terminal, you can see the waterfront esplanade being planned adjacent to the Empire Outlets. Um, immediately south of the ferry terminal is waterfront esplanade that's being uh, planned adjacent to the Lighthouse Point development. And here in between is the Tompkinsville esplanade, um, which currently uh, EDC has funding for a certain degree of shoreline stabilization in the area, but they continue to explore opportunities to be able to make this a more uh, continuous pedestrian and cycling corridor to connect these areas. Regarding the creation of affordable housing, um, we'd like to speak to you a little bit more about the development of new affordable housing and the increased access to existing affordable housing. So uh, as of certification, HPD has released their draft housing plan and they're continuing to meet with elected officials and community groups to further refine those recommendations um, for uh, for the future. Additionally, uh, they sought the amended application, which increased the number of affordable housing units uh, at the Jersey Street Sanitation Garage by an additional 115 units, which set aside 90 uh, to be for, for affordable senior residents, uh, as well as allocated floor area for future commercial or community facility uses. And lastly, HPD has been working with Council Member Debbie Rose uh, to schedule a housing fair uh, to uh, you know, let the community know about existing programs and future programs that may exist through this rezoning. 
regarding supporting new and existing businesses in the area, I would like to provide a just brief update on the Neighborhood 360 program and the work that we're doing uh, with the Parks Department to find ways for parks to work as a catalyst for economic development. So first, uh, at that certification we briefly mentioned, the Village Hall at Tappan Park. So this is the, the core of the Stapleton neighborhood. Uh, in 2018, the Parks Department released an RFP seeking uh, vendors uh, to provide concessions in this, this facility, which at this current time is vacant. Um, so the program is seeking for active uses, active use concessionaires, as well as the creation of community space within this building. Uh, unfortunately, the building requires a fairly substantial amount of repair prior to it being able to be retenanted. Um, but the Parks Department is currently reviewing these proposals so they can refine the programmatic requirements and cost requirements of moving forward. Um, the Neighborhood 360 program, which began in 2017 and continues to operate in the area, uh, has been uh, very successful. Um, in addition to uh, so what you can see here, they've also been providing additional trash and sanitation services, holiday lighting, district branding, and public art campaigns. So that image to the left um, is from their Courtyard Fridays program, um, which is taking a underutilized public space between the Richmond County Courthouse and the Borough Hall uh, and turning it into a um, you know impromptu concert venue during the summer months. Uh, the right is, is an image from their uh, 1000 Gates program where they're seeking to take uh, you know, what would otherwise be shuttered storefronts and turn them into opportunities for public art. And lastly, uh, to meet the plan's objectives of aligning investment in infrastructure, open space, and services. I'd like to talk a bit about the flexibility uh, being provided at Stapleton Waterfront, some transportation improvements, and addressing school seat need. So first, with regard to schools, uh, in 2018, um, the construction of two schools in the area, either completed or began. So first, the intermediate school at Gordon Street, which was completed right just immediately prior to certification, providing 264 intermediate seats in the adjacent area, uh, as well as groundbreaking at 357 Targi, which is anticipated to be completed in uh, 2022, and will provide nearly 750 elementary school seats. Additionally, since certification, um, the School Construction Authority has released their new capital plan, which identifies 1,700 additional elementary seats to be located throughout the subdistrict, and the department continues to work with them to help identify locations. <coughs> and lastly, the amended application for the zoning text amendment, uh, which seeks to exempt 100,000 square feet of floor area for a school, will allow for the, uh, the <clears throat> will allow for future siting of a school uh, within the Stapleton and St. George neighborhood as that growth occurs uh, through development at Stapleton Waterfront and along Bay Street. And lastly, regarding transportation, um, in January, the city announced that Staten Island would be included into the expanded ferry network for NYC Ferry System. Uh, so this is a very exciting announcement that would provide uh, additional water-based transportation methods from the existing St. George Ferry Terminal through a route that moves uh, along the west side of Manhattan uh, with the first stop at Battery Park and then ultimately uh, to Midtown West. So this would be approximately a 35-minute trip, which uh, you know today could take a pro about over an hour uh, through existing methods. So this was just an overview of some of the progress that's been made on these elements of the neighborhood plan. Um, and we hope to be able to report back to the commission with any future up updates uh, to any other projects or programs. So again, in summary, the applications before you uh, for you today will be at hearing on Wednesday. Um, seek zoning map amendments for the Bay Street Corridor and Canal Street Corridor, zoning text amendments to establish a special Bay Street Corridor District, uh, to modify the special Stapleton Waterfront District, and to modify Appendix F of the zoning resolution uh, for mandatory inclusionary housing. Uh, they seek the disposition of city-owned property at 55 Stuyvesant Place to facilitate commercial development in the St. George Business District, as well as the disposition and UDAP designation for the Jersey Street Garage to facilitate the creation of affordable housing. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Unlike the earlier part of this uh, meeting, I suspect we will have some questions. <laughs> Commissioner Capelli. Not necessarily questions for the... Uh proponents here, the, the local office, because we, we have met with them to, to talk about this, but I would just like to express my grave reservations about this plan. Um, I would call people's attention to the borough president's uh, uh, thoughtful uh, uh, comments. Uh, this area uh, I've worked on for my whole life. Uh, 
going back uh, to when I was a local planning board uh, uh, land use chairman, uh, is in great need of uh, infrastructure and services. Um, I hear as this goes along a lot of, well, maybe this can happen and maybe that can happen, but uh, that's not good enough to allow me to uh, commit my vote for the project. Uh, <coughs> I understand that a number of city agencies are gonna be coming to the hearing on Wednesday. I would suggest that they bring their checkbook and uh, be prepared to make some firm commitments uh, if they're going to move uh, uh, at least several members of this board. I think the plan is uh, uh, perhaps too ambitious in the area of commercial uh, for an island that has already got extremely high uh, uh, vacancy rate amongst uh, its uh, uh, commercial. I think that the school uh, commitments that are being placed are too far uh, from uh, the proposed district here and that uh, they, the city needs to be addressing with more immediate certainty uh, the uh, uh, future funding for a school to be in this area if we're going to potentially put 6,000 people in there. Uh, uh, I have grave reservations about the disposition of the city site at the sanitation uh, garage, which I think is a good thing for the community getting rid of that. I know the council member has fought for it probably for 40 years uh, since we worked together uh, way back when. Uh, but um, uh, I would be happier if it were a dedicated senior housing project. Uh, the city of New York made a monumental mistake 40 years ago in its land use application when we, uh, as a community board, uh, approved uh, a 235 program to go along Jersey Street down to uh, Richmond Terrace where the Jersey Street houses, uh, a NYCHA building was, and at the last minute the Board of Estimates switched it into low income along the street and essentially created uh, a, a, a very, uh, uh, a troublesome uh, uh, community that existed at the time. That there was a lot of thought and effort went in trying to balance the socioeconomic needs of the community, and uh, uh, quite frankly, only because of greed uh, and political connections of the developers were they able to get away with it at the time. When then Board of Estimates uh, swapped uh, out uh, a responsible plan for a. Uh, uh, a more profitable one for the developers. So, uh, you know, I am going to raise my voice on this project both here uh, and in the community as this process plays out over the next uh, month and a half. And uh, I would uh, uh, ask uh, all of you to keep an open mind about what's before you. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Cirillo. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much. First, Joe, I just want to uh, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very thorough. And Chris, let me just use this opportunity to congratulate you on your on your uh, promotion to director. So um, wonderful choice. Uh, so let me just ask a few questions, and I will. And I and I just want to also acknowledge the remarks of my of our colleague. Um, uh, I won't repeat any of the things that he said, but certainly they are sort of thematic to some of the long-term concerns, and certainly those of the borough president. But just some specific questions as quickly as I can. On the A-text, I want to recognize the the uh, proposed modifications to the visual corridors, which I know came up at certification, so thank you for that. I think that certainly will make a, a much more, uh, or provide for more attractive possibilities with respect to creating more open space, which, except for along the waterfront opportunities, this was a little uh, weak on. Um, uh, the. the I have uh, two questions about which grow out of the borough president's recommendations. One is about the school, and I just want to get some clarification because I, perhaps either I misunderstood it or it wasn't clear, but the, <coughs> the, the exemption for the school uh, applies only to what we'll call the northern site now, the, the two sites that are sort of captured as the northern site to Irby, 
It, it's it, it, that's correct. It's not so, anywhere within the rezoning. No, Joe, Joe's, Joe will find the slide, but the, the exemption is for up to 100,000 square feet for a school specifically, right. only on sites A or B1. So those are shown there okay. as the northern right. sites, formerly known as phase three, but we're, we've changed the thinking on how this might be phased, so now we're calling it the northern phase. Terrific, and then and, and the second piece of that, uh, staying on that question, um, <laughs> how are we defining school? So do you want to take that? Is it any type of school? Is it uh, a, a New York City public school of some level? Is, is it, you know, does it have to be 100,000 square feet of uh, one school? Could there be so the, multiple the, schools? Yeah, the, the, the A application is fairly flexible in how it's, this can be applied. Um, it's defined only as school use. So this can be 100,000 square feet of uh, public school. Uh, this can be potentially a, a, a private or a private nonprofit school. school as well. Um, and it, it, lastly, that 100,000 square feet is not specified for any particular use. I, our colleagues at School Construction Authority are taking a look at it for uh, elementary seats, since that is where the greatest need exists in the area. Um, how, you know, however, that does not preclude it from in the future being able to provide intermediate or uh, potentially even high school seats. Okay, so, so I guess the offshoot to that which applies to a variety of other issues here, but for different reasons, is about um, potentially who will be uh, coming to the public hearing representing different agencies. So will, will DOE or <laughs> SCA be appearing to discuss what they're thinking, if anything at all, because I know it says that there's discussions going on. Will they be shared? Um, and that really sort of in an overarching way applies to DOT and infrastructure and parks and so do we what do we expect in terms of uh, attendance for the hearing so sure so uh, a number of agencies will certainly be coming we can follow up with SCA to confirm and certainly you know pass along your comments and your questions I would say EDC will will be here uh, for sure to speak to their overall development okay. plan for yep. for that phase uh, which includes working closely with SCA on the site planning and some of the infrastructure upgrades that they're already you know about to kick off so as you know Front Street will be realigned there's a number of upgrades to water and sewer that are going along with this and so to make sure that they are, you know, identifying the best portion of that northern phase for a future school. They're working closely with SCA to identify their programmatic needs so that they're coordinating as all of that is moving forward. So uh, certainly they can speak and, more and to that. And DOT, DOT, DOT? Uh, DOT is absolutely at the table okay. in terms of no, the will, will they be realignment. present? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. good. Okay. Yeah. Um, one other thing on the ATEX, the, the as of right, <clears throat> the as of right physical culture establishments, um, I know raised, I'll say, I'll, I'll say little red flags um, only because of the history of, of this, uh, particularly the concern that arises in transition period. Um, <coughs> historically, there, the controls over um, citing these facilities, not in the way we think of them today as yoga and really healthy environments, but also the uses that are less uh, welcome to a neighborhood, uh, like massage parlors, which were part of the history here. Um, so I just wonder if there's an opportunity to look at that, um, particularly to see if there's some level of control before we, as of right, permit all the uses that are possible. It, perhaps in 2030, that would not be a use anyone would contemplate for all the successful reasons the neighborhood we, ho we hope to see. But, uh, but over the summer, it could be, um, where this neighborhood is still in serious transition. Um, so I think that that's an important issue to raise. We'll, um, we'll absolutely take that back and look at that. Okay, and I'm, I'm moving fast. And and uh, the infrastructure issues, we'll talk with the agencies directly. Well, can I just ask what impact at all, and I know this has sort of took everybody by surprise, but in terms of whether the DEIS or the FEIS will have taken a look at this, but the announcement or the proposal to build a shelter in the middle of, um, of the rezoning area in, in really an amazing piece of it on Victory, um, what 
what impact do we see that as do you see as the department? I mean, I know this is per perhaps an awkward question to ask you, but um, still, I think it needs some addressing in terms of what what does it mean, uh, and will it at, by FEIS be incorporated into any analysis of what it may mean to the neighborhood or future development? Perhaps not, um, but just wondered what sure what it might mean. I'll, I'll make sure my colleagues from our environmental division come up and correct me if I say anything wrong. But uh, we that's not within the immediate rezoning area. It's certainly within the context area. It's across the street. Right. We, we know the proximity that's from of talking it. EIS. I'm not, I, you know. Yeah, I, I will say that, you know, that came to light for us very, very late in the process, um, you know, the same way that it came to light for a number of people. Um, so we did go back to our environmental team and, and ask that question. The EIS assumes a certain amount of, of growth in the surrounding area for background growth at Etc. That particular site is in the St. George Special District and was analyzed for development potentially up to 14 stories. So we think that the proposal for the shelter there is accommodated within the background assumptions that we made already. Um, but we're certainly looking at that, and the FEIS will will identify any additional information that we need to. Consider. You know, I, and I can understand that piece of it. But what I what I'm thinking more about, and this goes into the uh, services in the neighborhood, right? The impacts that services have, or services that might otherwise be needed or or called upon to be used because that's obviously something the direct and indirect impacts of services in the neighborhood were important even though you know I still can't get past the the the, the, the uh, section on police fire and health care that indicated that even though we're you know potentially welcoming 6,000 new people to this neighborhood that this is uh, considered uh, not a new neighborhood where none existed before, so therefore they didn't get into that, which I'm still confused about. Um, but in this particular case, those who may be calling this location home, even temporarily, uh, if this continues and occurs, will certainly need services that, even that's just outside the rezoning area, is still part of the neighborhood, and I just wondered if that there was any consideration to what so, that would mean on the environmental impact. And it would, we will absolutely take that into account. So we know, you know, it's a family shelter. There will be children. They will need to go to schools, things like that. The environmental review will certainly account for that. Absolutely. I can't speak to specifics because we're going through that process, but yes. Well, anyone who could come and perhaps shed some light on that during the during the hearing on Wednesday would be very helpful. Thank you. I'll. And, and if not during the hearing, during post-hearing follow-up, because as Chris noted, the review is underway right now. Yeah. Other questions? Commissioner Delos. Um, I just want to see if you can um, provide a little bit more background behind one piece of the recommendation from the community board and the borough president. It seems like the community board was going for deeper affordability and the borough president was going for all four MIH options. I'm wondering, were there different people testifying at the different hearings? Or did um, I misunderstand what you said? So uh, the borough president didn't hold a hearing, um, just to be clear. But I, my recollection from the community board is I think that they were also looking for a range of affordabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they were their comments were fairly in line. So I think my takeaway from the hearing at the community board was we certainly had people on both sides who were looking for deeper affordability as well as, as the other range of options. So I think generally everyone's looking for the most flexibility possible in this area. Yes, just as additional. So as a follow-up, uh, the community board's recommendation, which is the, I believe, the second one <clears throat> here, um, was to reassess affordability and ensure that it's consistent with the neighborhood. So this is actually one of the recommendations that led to the AIRS uh, proposal that was submitted in the A text. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't necessarily, uh, as, as I took it, a stance on which affordability options should be made present, but rather that affordable housing should uh, try and reach the broadest spectrum of needs in the area. Okay, I guess I, I read that differently, especially when you look at the, in, the statistics in the community and what market is already producing. Right. I mean, there's, there certainly are advocates for the deepest levels, um, but the community board presented the widest swath of, of mm -hmm. opinions. 
Yeah, okay. there were certainly an organized group of people who came and, and spoke to deeper affordability, but there was also a sort of an equally large contingent, I would say, who were speaking to really only wanting sort of workforce options. So we kind of got both opposing views. I don't want to, you know, assume what they meant by this condition, but that was sort of the... Okay. Yeah, I mean, it'll, I think it would it would be the first time, if, if it were to be mapped, it would be the first time that all four options, I think, would be mapped as part of a neighborhood rezoning. Right. Thanks. Can I just... Yes. Commissioner Sorilla. Of knowing sort of firsthand the discussions taking place, I think what's happening here, which, and I'm not suggesting this is unique to any other neighborhood, but there is, we're, we're, when we're typically in neighborhoods, what's happening in one neighborhood is not necessarily being viewed by the neighborhoods that are 10 neighborhoods away. What What's happening here is that this is being viewed island-wide as a neighborhood rezoning, and there are people really interested, whether they live in Tottenville or they live in St. George, about how this neighborhood becomes a neighborhood because everyone wants access to this new neighborhood. It isn't just about building a new one within the <coughs> context of the boundaries. It's, it's about adding a completely new type of neighborhood. This, this type of neighborhood does not exist on Staten Island at all. Um, the idea of, of, you know, sort of, you know, mid to high rise residential buildings and commercial buildings is completely new. So I think, some of it is a learning experience, clearly, but I think everything is being done. And yes, there are people at both ends who only want one and none of the other, and some who want only the other and none of the other. The reality here is I think the attempt is to create the most diverse opportunities for income levels, housing types, and to build a neighborhood that we can blend with senior citizens and, you know, millennials and everybody in between, you know. So I, I, I know we typically just look at the, at a community board and its statistics and it's, and yes, we need to do that. But I think part of this messaging is about how are we building this brand new looking, feeling and experience in, an, in, a, in a borough that is not used to any of this at all, but yet have opportunities for people not to have to leave the borough, to welcome new people into the borough, not displace people, but give them a new place that they can come across the street to. Um, so I just, I just put that out there because I know maybe when you look at a stat, something seems one way, and but yet at the same time, I, there's like 15 things trying to be balanced here at the same time. We'll see how it would, where it goes. Obviously, we don't, we're not the last, we don't get the final say on that. This will go to the council at some point, and, but um, I think that's really where everybody's heads are at, the community board included, so. Everybody wants to live near Fred. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Understandably. Uh, <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Well, I certainly appreciate the local um, perspective and don't presume to have, you know, even a fraction of an understanding of this particular neighborhood. And I know um, that, you know, how intensely um, individual neighborhoods look at their surroundings and um, develop their priorities and care about what needs to happen. Um, I would certainly share Commissioner Capelli's um, observation that we need a lot more um, commitment to some of the infrastructure improvements that have been talked about um, and identified, but <coughs> seems like they need to be made real as part of this um, whole process. Um, on the notion of mapping all four options for, afford uh, for MIH, is the idea that it would get narrowed down to, I mean, if they're, if they're all four of them are on the map, we know what the developers are gonna pick when they go, except for on larger city-owned sites where the city can control what's gonna happen. But if you map all four, um, you know, it may well be that the developers can't respond in the way that the community is expecting, particularly when, as I see in the EIS, the observation that the um, development capacity 
um, in the area is insufficient to support new development without subsidy. Right. So I think we need, um, I would like a much more clear understanding of uh, exactly how MIH is going to work in this area. Sure. So I think that we can, HPD will be here certainly on Wednesday and can speak to some of that. I think from our perspective, we were trying to give, we, again, we've heard community feedback across the spectrum on this and from the electeds. And so we were just providing flexibility to allow those conversations to continue through the public review process. So um, they may, but they, 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 they may come to an end at the city council. It's not like the thing would sail out with flexibility still um, in intact. Still presumably available. the council member will, uh, okay. the city council okay. will make the decision on this. Good, yes. good, good, good. Okay. Um, I, n I also note from the EIS that there is some open space mitigation that's required. Um, in addition to a bunch of other stuff, but, um, you know, when we get these EISs that identify mitigations and say we will, we, we will or identify the impacts and say we will be discussing mitigations um, between now and then, well, we're at then, so um, it would be helpful to have a much more clear idea about how the um, identified impacts can be mitigated. Sure. So uh, I, I we'll bring back more information. I think in part it's it's the 12 acres of open space being contemplated along the Stapleton waterfront, so that it is immediately adjacent to to this area. So that is a significantly new uh, addition of, of of both active and passive recreational uses in that location. Um, and you know, uh, I would also add that there are significant regional parks just outside of the Seeker. Th you know, I, uh, the way that Seeker defines the study area for the open space. So Clove Lake Park and Silver Lake Park are located just outside of the, of the radius that we analyze. So, so those are significant active and passive recreational spaces within the study area as well, but, but we'll bring back more information. Okay. And what role does the Cromwell Street Rec Center play in all of this? I know that's a giant topic and a huge resource and something that there's been a lot of push and pull over after Mother Nature pushed it into the bay. Absolutely. Um, Sorry. We're, um, so uh, if I lived I, in that neighborhood, I'd be wanting a commitment yes, to that um, as part of this. And I will say that we're working very closely with parks to to come up with, with a solution there. They released a feasibility study within the last two years, I believe, that identified the need for a replacement facility, uh, analyzed a few different sites, and landed on a co-location with the current Lines Pool site, which is immediately adjacent to the rezoning, uh, to the highest density area that we're proposing. Um, I think that they're just working through further analysis to, to refine and identify the exact programmatic requirements of that site that will allow them to go through, you know, the next step of the process, which is, you know, detailed design and cost estimate. So um, that work is very much underway. Well, so, but maybe now's the moment to get real. Right, um, right. We're all concentrated on the need. They'll be here on Wednesday as okay. well. And Good. And yes, and I, I would Willow. just add that and appreciate that, um, that comment and, and thought. But I do believe just in following the story, um, that there is also a sense that the replacement of Cromwell was a commitment made long before this. And even though obviously this is an opportunity to finalize details for Cromwell, that some of the other local infrastructure issues should be separated from Yeah, No, it shouldn't be Cromwell. looked at as a trade. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, Past Correct. promise that needs to Correct. be kept, but it is a really necessary piece of of the community's um, need for sure. So you've been a huge loss not having Cromwell. I think we share the objective of, of trying to make okay. something happen. I'm sure you do. So. Yes. Other questions? Um, yes. Cheese is not here today. I have to ask about bikes. <laughs> <laughs> And as Thank someone you. who almost, except the weather was so lousy, toured, toured the area by bike. Um, Bay Street would seem to be, uh, you know, as we're making this planning for a new neighborhood, it would seem the perfect opportunity to really enhance bike infrastructure. It's pretty lame over there right now. Um, and I was surprised I not to not see lame. more attention given to that in 
sure. the neighborhood plan. So the Department of Transportation will be here on Wednesday and uh, we've queued them up to speak specifically to the bike infrastructure and some of the exciting stuff they're doing in the area. I will say that there are two different bike sharing programs that have come online in, in the North yeah, Shore in the last it. few months. They're like all over the oh, They are, <laughs> but they're very well used. Um, you know, as part of the re redevelopment and realignment of Front Street that's going on in, in concert with the Stapleton Waterfront development, um, they're looking at bike lanes there, and they're also in the process of implementing bike lanes along Van Duzer. So those are two of the streets parallel to Bay Street. I'll let them speak a little bit more to what they're doing along Bay Street, but, um, you know, they are looking at certainly the, the bicycle infrastructure throughout Especially the Especially if we're looking at bringing such a large new population into this area, mm -hmm. and given its proximity to um, the ferry. Um, perfect place yep. to live with transportation provided by bike rather than by car or bus. Absolutely. And I would say in addition to the work DOT is doing in terms of bike lanes along their streets, the, the waterfront esplanades also provide an opportunity as EDC is working through that work to, you know, encourage that continuous connection up and down okay. the waterfront. Good. Thank you. Not to mention um, the relatively flat topography, which makes it easy by uh, Yeah, until you get to that hill at the end. <laughs> right. No, the, it, the key is the connectivity. Of, yeah, of because course. even now with this sort of, it looks like the Wild West right now, bikes are, you know, they're out there and people are, I mean, as somebody who walks to the ferry every day, people are actually, I mean, not many, but it's the fact that it's, there's not many residents down there now, but people are actually using the bikes to get to the ferry and at night home from the ferry. Um, so you could imagine if if the waterfront is actually developed correctly or the inland roadway, which if you don't mind one one question, can you go back, Joe, to the the, the north side, the, the one where we saw the north side when we were talking about the school? Help me understand Front Street for a minute, because I remember when the siphon project occurred and we were doing the staple. Plan. No. Um, well, you know what? I'll work with that one. Sure. <laughs> um, the idea. So you have Front Street, and then one site is on the east and one site is on the west, right? And I know we had discussed during the siphon project and then during the special Stapleton waterfront, the, the roadway, the, um, the reconfiguration of the roadway. This doesn't look very reconfigured to me based on what's there today. So what what is the difference? I mean, obviously this is a rendering, but you know more that now? S turn, which is quite no, dangerous. Nasty. Um, <laughs> but again, it can't be there because the siphon, that turns around the siphon. So where, where are we in this picture to the understand? The S curve that you're thinking of is actually far more substantial nope. than it's showing here. This is actually showing it being um, sort of evened out a little That's bit more. That's the one I was thinking, yeah. Um, so. so we can bring in an aerial to show the existing, when we come back, we can okay. bring or provide you more this information is, this, on what it I, looks I like today. I thought of it because of the bike, like if, even if you're riding on the road, there is some pretty scary, yeah. you know, sketchy turns in there, and I realize none of it's developed now, but where is the siphon compared to site A? Is it north of site A? Immediately north of of site A, so, I believe. So the, 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 the DEP facility adjacent to uh, Lion's Pool is immediately north of site A, yeah. so part of the, um, yeah, so that's happening around here. I, I think that the confusion often becomes that the intersection realignment is not happening in the same exact spot that's, as the okay, current that's one. That's what it was, that S is south of yes. the S so that exists it's, today. It's currently um, it's happening, you know, maybe somewhere here in site site B, and the, the geometry of that intersection is far more angular. Yes. Uh, so this is moving north and creating a better development parcel at site B1, but also changing that geometry to make it a little bit smoother. I got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, Brian, do you want to explain about the timing of the public hearing on, on, on Wednesday? Uh, Yes, so um, we have this as the final uh, hearing uh, on Wednesday. We have a number of uh, other projects ahead of that. And our thinking was that we would, at the beginning of the public hearing, announce that this, hear this hearing for Bay Street would happen no sooner than, I think, 1130 was, was our thinking thought um, and that if the other hearings wrap up prior to that time, we can take a short recess and everybody can, you know, come back at that time. Otherwise, you know, it'll be 
in or around that time that this hearing so that they that the people coming from Staten Island can know that they um, won't miss anything if they're here um, at that time. But are you communicating? I'm sorry. Are you mm -hmm. communicating with people who say they're yes. coming? Yeah, we've been in touch with with a number of people um, who've indicated that they're coming. Do so we we'll. The big um, just never know. It, it, it's hard to tell. I think we're expecting certainly, you know, quite a few people. I don't know that it's going to be, you know, the crowds that we've seen in previous neighborhood rezonings. But there are a number of people who have asked if they can submit correspondence in writing. So we right. might expect a lot of that. I would just suggest, as you well know, that if people are coming in, they're taking the ferry, then they need to be on the 1030. Sure. Because at that point, <laughs> no, because, you know, they'll get on the 11 and then it'll be right. 11 to 20, you know, it's whatever. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're aware of the schedules. We'll make sure we pass that along as well. Yeah. And Good that's point. in part why we wanted to have a fixed time so people wouldn't have to be yeah. anxious about whether if the other hearings, if we flew through them, that they would miss the beginning of it. So with the commission's concurrence, we'll have a, we may need to take a short break. Okay. Okay, uh, for future votes, uh, staff have prepared reports for consideration on February 27th uh, for uh, the 41 Summit Street rezoning. Um, Commissioner Dale Ooz is recused on that for the record. Um, yep. Um, my own thinking on this has evolved a little bit, so I figure it's appropriate to put it out there. Um, I realize that we're now looking at a modified um, proposal that would zone these sites, um, this very small area, as uh, C6, uh, as um, R6A. Um, when the application was for an R7A, which I think we all came to conclude was um, a larger zoning than was appropriate for this site. Um, I would really have preferred a situation where we were not foreclosed from considering an R6B simply because it was out of scope from what the applicant first applied for. Um, this site, this is a relatively small site in a stretch along several blocks that still has this M zoning, which I think we've largely recognized is obsolete. Um, but I'm troubled by being backed into a zoning conclusion for one particular site when we really should be looking at the whole. And we're backed into it because the applicant proposed something way big and we want to propose something less, but maybe not uh, in as comprehensive a way as we would have done if we were looking at a larger rezoning area. So um, anyway, that's, I'm, I'm persuaded it was, and honestly it was the, um, we got some written testimony from the um, community that sort of pushed us toward um, just denying the application, urged us to deny the application because what we really should be considering is an R6B and we can't consider, if you can't consider an R6B, you should just say no. Um, and I have to say, I'm still mulling over where I am on this, but I have to say I found that argument um, pretty compelling. I have to um, clarify that the department believes that the R6A is appropriate. It's not just a being backed into it. Uh, what we did was look at the massings that were available on the sites. Um, the particular site, the applicant site, has the transition rule, which imposes right. restrictions. Even if the other two parcels were combined, this market is not a Manhattan, let's build as tall as we can market. It's less, let's build um, in a way that's economically the most viable, which would be the shortest number of stories that allow you to maximize the floor area that you're allowed. And so we are comfortable that the buildings that would result on the other two parcels, whether standing alone or much more likely merged, would be appropriate. And those other two parcels actually are along the wider expanse and 
we believed that the sites can handle the five-story buildings that we believe are likely to emerge. So I understand the desire. Um, I think it's uh, the issue of scope is one that we think is tremendously important. It's a matter of due process of what people are to expect. I certainly understand the, the wish to have um, a do-over and look at it, but the department does believe that an R6A is appropriate. No, I, I fully, fully respect that. I guess I come down in thinking that it would be, it, it would have been better had we been able to have a discussion about a whole range of possibilities, including the, po the one possibility that the community really wants to have happen here. And had that been able to go through the Euler process as, a, um, as an option, I would feel better about where we are now. I fully respect that, um, you know, the department's conclusions that the R6A is appropriate. But I think for sake of process, it would be better that we didn't, that, we, that we hadn't arrived at that conclusion in the way that we have. Understood. Okay. Um, thanks, Katie. Thank um, uh, moving on, also uh, for uh, consideration on February 27th, 103 North 13th Street, the McDonald Avenue catering rezoning, uh, Blondell Commons, uh, also scheduled for a decision on that date are uh, Nilo Court, 99 Seacrest Avenue, 93 Mani Avenue. Uh, those are, I believe, South uh, Special South Richmond District actions. Moving on to post-hearing follow-up, uh, we have a 460 Atlantic Avenue Child Care and Senior Center, Urban Strategies Daycare Center, 1640 Flatbush Avenue rezoning. Um, on both 1010 Pacific and 1050 Pacific, uh, I wanna note that the Brooklyn office is working on responses and will be back at the March 11th review session for a thorough follow-up. Can, can we go back to the 1640 for a sure, second? Sure, 1640. I, um, I mean, I, I think the, the main thing that I took away from that hearing was um, I think part of what the borough president recommended, which was maximizing the residential FAR rather, rather than adding a second floor retail. Um, I don't know if the department has thoughts on that. Uh, we can take that back and have a conversation with the Brooklyn office and have them follow up. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, the moving on, on the follow up, uh, 245 East 53rd Street rezoning. And uh, finally, the Rupert Brewery URA garages. Uh, there was a letter in your package and the Connor Clark is here uh, to discuss. Things to say. Yeah. Good afternoon. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. No, no questions on this? Okay. I believe that this uh, concludes uh, the New York City Planning Commission review session for Monday, February 25th, 2019, and the time is 3.07 p.m.